So welcome. Uh, this is our second time we're doing the NL Viz workshop. Uh, it's a workshop um, that Arjun Trinivasan and I are doing. We both are at Tableau. Um, last year we did this completely virtual, so it was really hard to gauge and just get a sense of interest. So decided to do it the second time and um, excited to see a lot of you here in person, you know, just having these serendipitous conversations before the workshop, as well as folks who have decided to join online. Um, just a little bit of uh, background um, about me. I, um, I have a background in natural language processing and graphics. Um, generally, my research covers three main areas, um, interested in exploring interfaces uh, where one can interact with data through natural language, um, fundamentally interested in understanding data semantics and user intent. And most recently, I've been interested in the interplay between text and charts. Um, we also have a paper here later um, at the conference that Chase Stokes will be presenting. Um, yeah, and uh, I will hand it off to Arjun, and he can quickly introduce himself as well. Hey, everyone. Great to be here and see all of you in person and for everyone joining remotely. Uh, yeah, I'm Arjun, been at Tableau now for almost two years. Uh, for uh, three years before that and the last two years, been thinking a lot about language and the role that language can play both as an input and output modality in the context of visualizations. So thinking about uh, language as, as a way to complement charts with, uh, with facts that you can read about the chart from, thinking about it as an input modality, particularly voice and sort of going beyond the post-WIMP sort of settings. And uh, finally, just helping out other developers who struggle to do this like me, hopefully with some tools that can make life easier for them. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Great, so the whole premise of this workshop in general uh, was, you know, when I joined Tableau nearly 10 years ago, the whole idea of thinking about natural language with data visualization was, was pretty new, it was pretty nascent. Uh, but fast forwarding forward, it, you know, just moving forward here, it's, it's kind of heartening to see the community open up. There's just been a lot of interesting work in this space that transcends uh, the visualization, NLP, and the HCI communities. So we thought it would be a really nice opportunity to have a workshop that brings all these three communities together so we can discuss different ideas and perspectives um, and just try to form a community around this mission of language and data so that we can continue um, to evolve this topic as we move on. And so um, as part of this workshop, we did invite workshop papers uh, that were across these three themes, um, not strictly, but you know, these were some guidelines. We were uh, looking at papers that explored integrating or thinking about how text and charts work together, um, any sort of interfaces or uh, thinking about interfaces around natural language interaction, and just fundamentally understanding how the semantics of data can help inform a more meaningful depiction of data. And these are just some logistics. We have um, Slido for uh, both in-person and remote questions, which um, both the student volunteers and you know ourselves, the co-chairs, will be monitoring. We have a Discord channel. I encourage you to join that as well. And this is the live stream and program information as well. And, and we have um, seven papers and so that will be um, dispersed across the, the rest of the day. And hopefully, we'll have some time for um, discussion. And so if you have any specific topics that you want to bring up, um, do let us know. And so with that, um, I'd, I'm really excited to have here Amit Prakash, um, who is the co-founder and CTO of ThoughtSpot. Um, and Amit graciously um, decided to come here and present his keynote in person. Just a little background about him. He has um, a lot of deep experience building large-scale analytics uh, systems. And prior to ThoughtSpot, uh, he led engineering teams in the Google AdSense businesses, and prior to that was uh, the founding, um, uh, founded engineering in the Bing team at Microsoft, where he implemented PageRank algorithms from scratch. He received his PhD in computer engineering from the University of Texas at Austin, and a Bachelor of Technology in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur. 
Um, and with that, his keynote is titled Problems Worth Solving at the Intersection of NLP and Structured Data. works. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge something that uh, I so I, I am one of the co founders and CTO of ThoughtSpot and uh, where they and Arjun are at Tableau. And in the marketplace, we compete fiercely. <laughs> so from some perspective, you could say that we are from opposing teams. But from the other perspective, we both care about a lot about unlocking the value of data for the world. So in that sense, we are in the same team. And the fact that she invited me here says a lot about her and who she is. So thank you so much. Really appreciate that. So before I um, get into the meat of the topic, let me ask you a very important question. Why do you think it took Tom Cruise 36 years to make the second movie, Top Gun movie. Any guesses? For the longest time, their team did not know how to write sequel. Wow. <laughs> so for those who didn't get it, it was a play on SQL versus a movie sequel. Anyways. <laughs> That, that's true for a lot of the world, that they don't know how to write SQL. And, and that's, that was sort of the entry into this slide. So um, who we are at ThoughtSpot, we, we say that our mission is to create a more fact-driven world. And what we mean by that is that um, if you can put data on, in places where decision is being made and people are able to access insights from data, it will be a lot less driven by opinions and a lot more driven by data and the world will be a better place for it. Um, but the challenge is that um, by some estimates, th there are about 1.2 billion information workers, people who could benefit from information and data, but there are only about 1.5 million people in the world who could be considered quote unquote data experts who could interrogate data and get insights out of it. And, and the, the intersection between these is, is very, very narrow and thin. And so what we've been trying to do is with use of um, sort of technology, machine learning, and UX, push these circles together and, and grow, grow the intersection much larger so that a lot more people can benefit from data. And, and so when, when I got this invitation, I had a selfish motive of coming here to basically see if I can inspire the brilliant minds in this room to sort of work on the problems that I've cared deeply about for the last 10 years or so. And so hopefully you're all ready to get fired up about these problems and, and do something interesting with it. Um, and I, I figured mostly because this is a room, of, room full of researchers, let's talk about what, what makes up a good research problem, right? So at least in my opinion, um, it's, it's an intersection of three things. You want to get to really high value problems um, where if you solve the problem, you can unlock a lot of value. Um, nobody wants to work on sort of side problems. But at the same time, it has to be what we call adjacent possible, or, or in other words, timing has to be right, that you can't lay the brick at this level if sort of the layer below hasn't been uh, laid out already, and, and so, so you can't innovate in a space where a lot of science still needs to be discovered. And so from that sense, I, I think these problems are just ripe for disruption. And then last thing, you want a lot of unanswered questions, otherwise what would be the fun of working in research, right? Um, so, so what I'll try to establish is that the class of problems I'm talking about kind of fall in this category where there's a lot of value in solving them. There's a lot of adjacent technology that has come up recently so, so it's ripe for people to apply themselves in there. And, and there are a lot of fun problems to solve. Um, so why is this a high value problem? To unlock value from data? Um, 
nobody needs a reminder of the pandemic. And a lot of response to pandemic was really about data, right? In, in general, we live in a world that's rapidly changing and our ability to adapt to it and respond well really depends on uh, people being conversant with data, being collecting the right data, getting the right insight in the right places quickly. And in the private sector, if you look at what's happening, a lot of old school companies are just getting annihilated by new modern, what people call digital native companies. And one of the big reason is data. That's why everyone has woken up in the last several years. And, and like every boardroom is talking about data. Every large company has a chief data officer or chief data and analytics officer. If you just combine the spend in enterprise across sort of data warehousing and analytics, it's around $70 billion a year. And with still with that, if you measure the adoption rate of the people who have access to the tools for data and who is using it, it's, it's a little under 30%. And so there's huge potential for making these tools better and more accessible for the world. And I'll, I'll just give you kind of a single anecdote. Uh, we were working with a bank in Australia and um, they, for the first time, they had the ability to easily ask questions of their data without involving a third party and people started going asking a lot of questions. And within a few hours, they, they found that they had missed a massive number of um, essentially insurance claims that they were supposed to be getting paid by a third party because of a software bug. And, and that single insight was worth $30 million to the company. So I just wanted to go from sort of high level to individual data points, how valuable it can be to unlock data. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's a high value problem. Why the timing is right, um, pretty much anybody you talk to is now convinced that it's worth spending a lot of time, a lot of money in data. And, and, and with cloud and various technologies coming together and everything in the world getting digitized, there's no shortage of data. Um, most large companies are now dealing in petabyte and exabytes of data. And, and there's been a lot of massive uh, innovation lately in large language models. Um, a lot of public data sets are available for researchers. And, and in general, there's been a lot of progress in NLP. So, so hopefully we've kind of squared off the first two things on my triangulation. And, and so now we get to talk about the fun problems, right? Um, so let me begin with more of a product hat than a research hat. So let's say if your goal was to let every person who cares about data be able to ask questions from data. What are various approaches that um, you could take? And here, I, I, would dis, I would give a qualifier that this is my opinion, um, and, and you're free to agree or disagree with it. But since I'm here, I'll, I'll talk about my opinion here. So um, th there's one way to do this is to try and design a clever user interface where people could express the questions in their head. And what I have seen is that the two places where it becomes difficult, one is if the question is complex, you cannot have a single UI interaction for that. So then you have to break it into smaller pieces. And now the task of taking a complex problem and breaking into smaller problems is left to the user to figure out. And that's usually the hardest part of solving a complex problem, taking a complex problem and breaking it into smaller solvable pieces, right? And the second thing is that when the namespaces become very large, um, then it's hard to drive things through UI. Now, an alternative approach that you could take is say, let them just ask the question the way they want to ask and, and use pure natural language. And even that I've seen is fraught with a lot of problems. Um, in real world, the questions t tend to be fairly complex. And um, by the time you've collected all the details from the person who wants to ask the question, it's no longer a one sentence question. It could be a paragraph long question, right? And people just don't talk like that. People just don't say that like, 
give me the revenue of all the products in last three months, but exclude all the return products and discount the revenue from all the partners by appropriate percentages and, and things like that, right? So, so but, but this is the real nature of the question that needs to be asked, right? And, and natural language is also quite ambiguous, um, partly because that's the way language evolved and partly because people get lazy when they're asking questions and they leave out details because they're used to human beings at the other end who are plugged into the same context as them and are expected to figure out um, the missing context, right? Uh, so one of the approaches that we took at ThoughtSpot looking at this, at least in the first several years, was to design almost what I call a DSL factory, right? So we, we look at a data set and uh, we, we look at all the entities in that data set, like the column names, the values, and everything. And then we construct on the fly a domain-specific language for that data set. And then we give you sort of a Google-like search bar where it's, it's not a free-form natural language thing. You're still working in a DSL. Um, but this DSL is designed to feel as if it's, um, it's close to natural language. There, there are no sort of... Um, um, there's no commas and curly braces and things like that. You just kind of take the concepts and put them to string them together and it works. And, and, and there's a lot of machinery behind the scenes that helps you formulate the right question and disambiguate things. And it's worked really well. We have hundreds of customers, some of the largest enterprise in the world, where thousands of people who never were able to ask data questions before are able to ask data questions. But it still leaves something to be desired, which is... To be able to use this interface, people need to be somewhat literate in data, like how data has been organized in different data structures, different tables, different columns, and things like that. And, and they do need to understand a little bit of how the system works. And so my ideal vision is a combination of this DSL model and an NLP system layered on top of it with an intelligent feedback system. And so, so I'll, I'll go a little bit in detail what that means and um, then we'll look at it layer by layer. So th this DSL engine itself required massive amount of engineering, and this is not the topic of this talk. So I'll, I'll very briefly talk about what goes in there. Um, I, I could give an hour long talk over this, but um, I just want to establish it so that we can, we can talk about what we're going to talk about next, right? So what this DSL engine is doing behind the scenes is basically building an index of every entity in that particular data set, which is typically column names, synonyms of column names, and then different values, as well as um, certain keywords that are often used to talk about these kinds of questions. And then there is an auto-completion engine with, where there's a Bayesian model sitting behind it that's trying to predict if the user asks this, then what's the next thing they're going to ask for and what's the next thing they're going to ask for. And, and that essentially provides the auto-completion and auto-correction so that people are able to ask specific questions. And then there's a fairly powerful query generation engine that can um, take everything that's there in the data, mo um, data model and combine that with a question and generate the right SQL. Um, a very interesting part of this model is also what I call a query modification language. So asking data questions is often an iterative process, right? And so, so people ask one question and then they will jump to a neighboring question. For example, they might ask like, what's the total revenue for last three years? And then they might say, how does it break down by different products? And then they might want to look at the top 10 products. And then once they're looking at top 10 products, they might want to break the top bar by a different zip code or something like that, right? So, so we've designed a system that can take one query and then get you to the neighboring query in a very intuitive way. So that's overall the, the system that I call DSL engine. Um, and, and this is what it looks like in practice. So, so you ask these questions and, and you, you get the response and then if you want to build what we call light boards, you, you can put them all together in a dashboard-like setup. Um, and, and then you will see um, uh, like drill downs and things like that happening on top of that, which is the query modification piece. So that was just to establish what the, what the DSL experience is like. 
Now, let's talk about the NLP part of it, right? So what, what we want is people to still be able to express the questions in the way that they are comfortable in. But then we want to be able to translate that into the DSL-based system, and then from there get them the result. Now, advantage of doing it this way is that people may not be sort of familiar with the data structures, and they may not be able to express the question in the DSL. But when they read it, it makes perfect sense to them. And if it doesn't make sense, they also have the ability to modify it. right? So, so they can start from what they know and then go to something that makes sense to them, but yet they very precisely know what, what has been translated to. And, and there's no ambiguity in um, what, what is the question for which they are getting the answer to, which, which tends to be really important in this domain. Um, <clears throat> And then this is where feedback becomes really important because you ask the question and then the system interprets um, what the question perhaps means. And if, if this answer is correct, then, then the user moves on. But if it's not, then they provide feedback to the system. And this feedback becomes sort of the fertile ground for the system to learn and get smarter. And, and, and so over time, this translation engine becomes much better. Um, I'll describe sort of a fairly simplistic approach to achieving this. Uh, and the point here is not that this is the way to solve the problem. The point here is that if you want to learn, it's really good to start simple and build a system that works and allows you to collect feedback. And then you can improve the systems after that. Right? So, so this is kind of like how classic systems were built before sort of deep neural nets came out and blew everything away, right? So you have kind of um, a problem of simultaneously taking a sentence and tokenizing it and then sort of doing entity extraction. And this is not sort of the regular NER stuff, right? Because th there are all kinds of nouns that exist in a corporate data that an NER system just wouldn't know. So this is where the index becomes really important and you go and sort of find what everything means and then you assign different probabilities of different matches. And then from there, you, you essentially do a hypothesis generation of various combinations and then you do a beam search and you output a DSL, right? Um, so this is, this is one of the very first things early on we tried and this is what helped us learn what are the different problems in trying to build such a system, right? And, and so I'll list most of the important problems in trying to build such a system. So the first one is that there, there's very little tolerance in a system like this when you're putting it in front of real life business users who are trying to make real decisions. Um, I've already talked about natural language being ambiguous and then some of the information being missing. It's not just that the information is missing, it's also that that information is not available anywhere in public domain. Um, most of the times, this is locked in brains of individual people inside individual companies. And um, some, sometimes you can ask a question in a very simple way, but actually, it, it can blow up to a fairly complex calculation. And that's, that's just the nature of how natural language works. And the other thing is, if you're putting a system out like this, it's naturally going to have its limits as to what it knows and what it doesn't know, what it can do and what cannot do. And the only way such a product could succeed if the system is actually self-aware in a sense that what it can and cannot do and respond appropriately when it's faced with a problem that it cannot solve. Uh, so so let, let, let's go over these challenges one at a time. Um, near zero tolerance. So if you go back maybe five to 10 years, a lot of people in the industry got burnt because everyone was excited about analytics and ID processes were slow. So what people were doing was making a copy of data and putting it in Excel or something like that and then going, doing their own analysis and going to boardrooms and presenting. And in this process, everybody came up with 
different conclusions and different numbers. So even simple fact like how many customers somebody has, different people will have different spreadsheets with different numbers. And <clears throat> this made it impossible for people to trust any number. And then data became absolutely useless. So now when I talk to anyone in industry, they are loath to use any system where there is even like a 0.1% chance that somebody might get data that wouldn't be um, accurate because then they lose total trust in the community of users and whatever effort they have put become complete waste, right? So, so even simple ambiguity, like if someone asks how much revenue did we get from China, it could mean that you're talking about customers who live in China or it could mean that um, revenue coming from suppliers who are supplying you things from China. Now that's a less obvious one and we know that, but a system designed just based on some basic machine learning wouldn't know that. And if you leave a small chance of such ambiguities, then the system is completely unusable in real world, right? Um, now let's talk about ambiguity in natural language. So, so th there is kind of obvious kind of ambiguity that a customer might have 10 kind of um, definition within the company. But the other kind of ambiguity that happens is because people don't specify things fully, right? So, so let's talk about a data set with Salesforce. I'm gonna talk a lot about Salesforce data set where um, there's different opportunities sitting in a table where somebody in the sales is trying to sell to someone, right? Now, if someone says, which opportunity has the highest value this quarter? What they're talking about is give me the name of the opportunity, opportunity name. But when someone says how much opportunity there is this quarter, what they're talking about is adding up all the opportunity amounts in that column, right? So that's one class of ambiguity. The other kind of ambiguity is parsing ambiguity. So United States, most of us will think means country, but given the right context, it could actually be talking about United as airlines and states as sort of a separate token that's trying to break some number by states. And um, this is somewhat contrived example, but the, the plenty of real life examples where it's unobvious. Um, then often when we talk about measures, we, we leave out the aggregation because it's obvious to us, right? But when you're talking about revenue, you obviously want to add up. When you're talking about something like customer satisfaction score, it doesn't make any sense to add them up. So what you want is an average. Um, the other kind of ambiguity that I see often is um, there are many, many different date, uh, dates in a table. For example, if you're talking about a retailer, they, there might be a date when they ship the thing from their warehouse. There might be a date when the actual order came in. There might be a date when it gets delivered. When someone says, how much revenue did I have in the last three months? What do you mean? Um, and, and, and this is such a question that even it, it could change from company to company. So there's a lot of ambiguity in the natural language. And then people tend to leave a lot of info important information um, in these questions just because they're expecting someone else over there who's getting these questions will be able to figure it out. So there's a travel company that I was talking to and they had this simplest question that how many of my customers are in New York, right? Um, what that means is that these people originated their travel from somewhere else. They landed in New York before today and then they're going back and that's after today. And not only that, they had New York in 17 different columns because it's city, it's a state, it's an airport. Um, it could be departure airport, it could be arrival airport, it could be hotel. So there's a lot of information missing from this set statement, but to a human being, it makes perfect sense. Um, the other kind of uh, missing information could be like somebody says, what are the fastest moving deals this quarter? This is again Salesforce data. It's not even clear what fastest deal means, right? They're, they're moving from stage to stage, but um, the, at best you can turn that into a vector of like how much time it took from stage zero to stage one and stage two. How do you compress that vector into a single scalar on which you can rank things? And, and that's gonna vary from individual to individual, company to company. And then there's this really quirky class of things that you run into. So talking to an airline, and their question was, what is A0 for DFW? And what they mean 
is when a flight arrives, there could be arrival delay, and that's A0 for them, average arrival delay. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is when I say, what is A0 for DFW, the filter I apply is arrival airport equal to Dallas-Fort Worth. But when I say what's D0 for DFW, the filter I apply for DFW is departure airport being Dallas-Fort Worth, right? So, so now, based on the context in which this thing is being used, it changes its meaning. And that context, that happens all the time in natural language, right? But, and a lot of natural language models could resolve this, but none of them would know what A0 means or what D0 means, right? And even if you add the synonymy here and say A0 really means average arrival delay, um, just the fact that arrival is in that, uh, in that expansion doesn't necessarily mean that you can always resolve this ambiguity based on that. Uh, in fact, when we tried it in practice, more often than not, that turned out to be wrong because you have so many spurious matches. This is another interesting example when we're working with uh, movies data set. So when someone says, how much money did Harry Potter movies make? There's no class of movies called Harry Potter movie. What the user really means is that find every movie title that contains Harry Potter in it. Now, this is a fairly big leap here in reasoning that this, this constraint is actually a contains constraint on strings in this particular context. Or when someone says, who owns Apple? This is again Salesforce data set. So what they mean is that who's the sales representative who's responsible for dealing with all the sales transaction with Apple? And again, it, it's not like in other domains when we work with NLP, we don't work with missing information. It's just that when you're working here, this information is locked inside individual organizations in heads of individual people who have very important other jobs to do, and they're not gonna sit around and give you thousands of training samples so that your model can learn that, right? Um, so the way we, we decided to solve this problem was essentially create this feedback loop. So I give something of value to the user, which is an answer that's 80% of the time correct, and the user gives me something valuable back, which is this feedback, that this is correct, this is not correct, this is how you fix it. The problem with this is A, like I said, they're very busy people with important jobs to do, so you can't get a ton of feedback from them. B, this feedback is often noisy and error prone. And so, so you almost need some sort of like a Wikipedia-like model where there are a lot of people who can go and edit the articles, but then you need some editors who are making sure that those edits are valid. And it's just hard to do when it's so fragmented across different use cases, different organizations. And then even when you get the correct feedback, attributing that feedback to why this is the way it is, like why is DFW here arrival airport and why is it departure airport? Nobody is sitting there to tell you that this is because A0 was here, or this is because D0 was here. Um, so that's what makes the feedback process challenging. And then comes this really interesting class of problems where when you put a natural language interface in front of people, they will ask all kinds of questions and they will have no idea whether the system is designed to do that or not. So for example, when we populated um, the system with the data from an IMDB data set with movies, one of the first questions somebody asked was like, show me all the Oscar winning movies in 2000, uh, 2021. And this data set has no idea what Oscar means. There's no column that says Oscar awards or Academy Awards or anything like that. Now, what does the system do? It finds an actor named Oscar Munoz and says, maybe your question is about that. And if you do things like that, then the, the trust in the system goes away again, right? So, so, so you have to design a system that's not only aware of the data it has, but also aware of things that people might ask around this data that it has no idea about. Same thing happens when you talk about, when you give somebody Salesforce data, they start talking about marketing campaigns and that information is not in there, but I bet there'll be some company named marketing leads or some such thing. And now you're, what you're suggesting back to the user looks very silly. Um, or people ask questions that's expecting a prediction when all 
you're providing as an analytical system. Um, and th this is, th the last bullet is another interesting aspect of the problem that I didn't talk about, is that when you invite users who have no idea how data is laid out, they also don't know which data set is going to answer their question. So, so you have to take their question and then find out which data set in your system exists that can answer this question. And that also is a very interesting problem in its own right. And then that leads to sometimes people asking questions about data set that just doesn't exist in your system. And now it could be anything under the sun. So I've talked a lot about what makes this a really hard problem. Let, let's talk about where we can make progress, right? So the, since we've started this work, there's been amazing improvement in natural language understanding through these large language models, right? And um, there are lots of interesting ways in which you can leverage these things and improve the accuracy of the system. Um, once you have sort of large companies trying to solve this problem, it's relatively easy to build large industry-based taxonomies that will solve the problem, for example, for all the Salesforce data set across all companies or all Jira data sets across engineering teams and things like that. Um, and along with that, you could also supply default procedures for computing complex things. So for example, a lot of companies care about customer churn. Um, and the, there's different ways of computing churn, but there's sort of a broad agreed upon method of what churn means, and you can expose that method with certain parameters and then you've taken care of a class of problems. The other thing that's really useful in trying to build such systems is knowing what the data is all about. So for example, it helps to know that this particular column represents a person, this particular column represents money, this particular column represents a place, and so on and so forth. So that when someone says, who did X, Y, Z, that who is now supposed to map to one of the columns that represents a person, right? And, and, and so it's, this is a relatively easier problem to take sort of a column of data in a table in its context and then try to predict what class of entities it represents. Um, and then I, I'm really positive that with all the advances in large language models, we could design better feedback capture mechanisms that not only gets the immediate feedback but also gets the attribution back um, from the user. Uh, so let's, let's talk about these individually. Um, large language models, what I've seen, so, so we got really excited when BERT came along. And what we saw was that with BERT, you could contextualize each word and its meaning within the context of the sentence much better than what you could do before. Um, when GPT-3 came along, uh, what we saw was that um, it had a lot more knowledge about the world than anything else before it. So for example, if somebody asks, what's the longest movie ever? The fact that longest means duration of the movie is something that you can ask for it and it'll actually, with the right prompt, it will tell you what longest means in this context. And then the, the codex model, which is sort of special purpose design for generating code, one of them being SQL, was really interesting. Um, not so much interesting from the perspective of the class of problems that I just talked about, because codex is designed to mostly take the information in the question and translate that into SQL. It, it cannot fill the missing gap. But nevertheless, for the later part of the pipeline, things like codex could be really helpful. Now, it's not all great. Like a lot of people, when I talk to them who are super enthusiastic about large language models, they're like, oh, why is this problem not already solved? And the reason this problem is not already solved is that it's only got the information in the public domain. It cannot answer questions like what's A0 for DFW, right? Um, and so, so then, then can, you, um, can you work with transfer learning? Can you, can you take these large language models and then feed it a little bit of training data for each use case? And what I've seen is that your ability to generate training data enough to just do out of the box fine tuning the way the technique exists, just 
is not practical at this point of time. So um, most organizations are, even when they engage in this kind of thing, you'd be lucky to get 100 training, training examples out of them. And, and you cannot throw sort of mechanical Turk sort of thing on top of these problems because the general public doesn't know what the right questions are and what the right answers are, right? Um, one approach that I've been really interestedly following is um, large la learning models that have external memory, right? Because essentially that entire database is kind of like external memory and it's very inefficient. If you've got a million product names and a million customer names and everything, it's really inefficient to try to train a neural net that knows about those million product names and customer names. But if you have a way of indexing into knowledge outside from your neural net and then using that for translation, then I see sort of a much more powerful way of building these kinds of systems. And I was really glad to see the paper from uh, this particular paper from DeepMind talking about that. I, it's nowhere close to applying it in this domain, but I, I see that sort of as an interesting research direction. Um, so I'll conclude with some interesting um, problems that may be worth thinking about as potential research problems. Um, so I, I think building a conversational engine that's multi-turn, that doesn't expect you to specify the question in one shot, but kind of gets you sort of um, the opening salvo for the question from the user and then intelligently ask disambiguating questions till the question is fully specified would be really, really interesting. And, and I know there's been a lot of work in multi-turned conversations, um, but I haven't seen any work in this particular domain. And I think that could be a really interesting problem to go after. Um, the one class of products where natural language has been really um, useful and practical is when you look at things like Alexa and um, um, Google Home and things like that, right? And what it is, is basically it's a platform for people to specify very, very specific, very narrow intents, and then a way to specify a procedure for implementing those intents. Like somebody may ask for weather for any location for any time, in 10 different ways, and all that maps to a procedure that goes to weather.com or wherever and fetches the weather for the right place for the right time, right? Um, so what you could do is build essentially a platform that's really good at figuring out the intents and the procedure for fulfilling, fulfilling that intent with a little bit of training data automatically, right? So. So you go to an organization and a lot of people tend to ask questions like, what are my top 10 deals for this quarter? Or who are my top 10 sellers and things like that. And if you have a system that can quickly take these intents and figure out how to answer them and all the sort of neighboring intents around it, that could be a really powerful system. And I think there's some interesting research questions around that. Um, I just talked about how, if you can figure out the semantics of data in a tabular form, it could be really useful. Like, for example, does this column represent money? Does this column represent a person or a place and things like that? And, and some of it is low-hanging fruit, but some of it becomes really interesting. And I, I bet there are some interesting problems to solve there. Um, it's been suggested to me many times that the missing context that I'm looking for to be able to solve this already exists in the internal communication of the company, right? So, so if there are a bunch of people talking about revenue and churn and things like that in their email, in their Slack and things like that, if you can process that information and, and figure out what is the definition of churn, what is the definition of revenue and things like that, and utilize that to answer these questions, there could be something really interesting there. Now, this kind of requires right now a little bit stretching your imagination and figuring out how you sort of figure out all kinds of privacy issues around there and um, all kinds of problems with taking a, taking a statement out of its context and trying to infer hard facts from it. Um, but nevertheless, I, I do think that there is some interesting exploration to be done there. And then I talked about um, questions are always, um, data questions are always iterative. One of the reasons I think 
we have succeeded in ThoughtSpot as a company is not just the, the DSL engine, but the query modification engine on top of it that allows people to go ask neighboring questions. So, so many times what happens is that the experts will curate a bunch of questions and put it in one place. And then sort of the eventual business users will come in and just look at the answer to that question. And then as a follow-up, ask the next question and the next question and the next question. And there they're not formulating all the details about that question in one go. They're just asking in small increments and that's a lot easier for them to express. And, and you could build the same thing in natural language as opposed to sort of a very regimented DSL kind of framework. And that would be a really interesting system. Um, so th this is my final slide. I I've, been, I've been working on building knowledge systems for a long time. I, I was one of the early engineers at Bing when we built the search engine. I was um, working on some of the world's largest machine learning models at Google uh, for AdSense before machine learning became cool. And then for the last 10 years, I've been building ThoughtSpot. And, and so these are kind of my general um, observations from trying to build large scale knowledge systems is that, uh, so the first one is that at the early stage, um, algorithms are absolutely useless. There's no point obsessing over algorithms because you, you can get to maybe 60, 70% of the accuracy with fairly simple, straightforward approaches. Um, and, and once you do that and you build a system that's somewhat usable, then you earn the right to go to the user and say, please use my system and I'll collect the data and I'll progressively make the system better. So it, it's, it's always worked better if you go with very simple algorithms, build a system, collect the data, and then iteratively refine it, right? Um, the second thing is that any knowledge-based system just gets built in layer after layer after layer of improvement. And, and the best results come when you're very maniacal about shrinking the time between somebody having an idea and how quickly can they test whether that hypothesis works or not, right? So um, for example, when I was at Google, there was a very large engineering team that was dedicated to, you have an idea and how quickly within like a few days you can test it across a very large sort of billion um, user interactions and come up with whether that idea worked or not. Like if somebody thinks that people who are checking sports scores will tend to click more on beer ads, you can go and test it. <laughs> and, and then you know whether that works or not, right? And, and when you accumulate a lot of these tiny improvements, you build a system that's dramatically better than anybody else. Um, and in the same vein, um, it's really important to know what you're optimizing for because you cannot have a large number of people working on a large number of ideas all together unless you can align them around one or two metrics. And so it's really important to have well-defined one or two metrics. I don't say one, I say two, because often when you become fanatic about one metric, you tend to make impractical decisions um, that just shows that the metric improved, but the real system didn't improve. So it's important to have at least one guardrail metric um, that, that makes sure that you're not tweaking the knob too much and, and, and fooling yourself that you're making a better system. Um, and then it's what happens a lot of times is there's a noise in your measurement system. And that noise determines how small of an idea can you validate or invalidate. And so if that noise is large, a lot of good ideas will just not, not show up in your experiments as good ideas and then you end up discarding them. Whereas if you shrink that noise, then you can accumulate lots and lots of small ideas together and, and accumulate them into a really giant uh, improvement for the system. So it's really important to shrink the amount of noise in your measurement system so that you can say whether an idea makes tiniest bit of improvement or not. Um, and then, I think um, I, I come from very sort of math theoretical background, and I, I used to have this tendency of sort of taking a real world problem and abstracting into a math problem, and then only focusing on the math problem and nothing else. And that's often 
a very losing strategy, which is what I've learned in the last 10 years of product building, is that you've got to always look at the broader context in whatever problem you're solving, figure out if, if you can combine user interaction with your machine learning and systems improvement, then you often lead to much better solutions than purely trying to turn the dial on your machine learning. And then the last point I will make is that no matter how good your system looks like in lab, when you put it in front of users, crazy things happen. And it, it never lives up to what you expected it to be. So always leave room for that and, and test early, test often. That's it. That's all the material I had. Hopefully you found it useful and mildly entertaining. I can take some questions. So we have time for questions. We might have to push the talks a little bit later. It's, I hope, okay. Um, any questions? I can ask the first one while people are queuing up. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I can kind of relate to a lot of the problems that you pose, especially when you're thinking about scaling analyze in the industry and working with different customers. So a few questions. It, it feels like, and this is something at Tableau that we've struggled with as well, that for data to be useful for natural language, the, the fields need to be human readable. Mm -hmm. um, there needs to be additional semantics, as you, as you noted. But quite often with customers like enterprise customers, they, it tends to be very domain specific. So there's a lot of heavy lifting ahead of using such tools where they need to sit and clean the data, add human readable labels, synonyms, and so forth, which can be tedious. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on, you know, how do we reconcile with that issue? And is there an alternative where should we be thinking about semantics for data more as a general service where natural language is just one consumer of it? I, I would definitely agree. But I, I think, um, fortunately or unfortunately, we both see that most enterprises see enough value in data that they're willing to put the manpower necessary to get the data in a shape that it could be human readable and understandable. And it mostly lives at the metadata layer, not data layer. So it's not like you're not dealing with millions or even thousands. It's usually hundreds of entities that need to be renamed. Um, so it tends to work out at least in the enterprise setting. Um, but I, I do think that if, if we can figure out a way to, if not completely eliminate, ease that process substantially with the kind of service you're talking about, it will, it will unlock a lot of value. And to, particularly what happens is that there's a delay between when a team gets excited about using a data and starts investing in tools and people and processes and when they actually get the value. And in, this, in the middle, there's kind of this valley of despair that comes and that kills a lot of use cases. So if we can shrink that and eliminate that valley of despair, I think a lot more value will be unlocked. Hi, thanks for the talk. It's really, really important topic. Uh, I'm June from New York University. Nice so time. actually, we we have information visualization course in mm -hmm. the in our school, and we're helping. Uh, so like usually in the beginning of the class, we the the first thing we teach the student is like we need to transform the domain questions into data questions. Mm -hmm. And then you do some data transformation and then do the visualization. Yeah. So usually uh, for one specific domain question, there can be many different data questions. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Like in, in our recent homework, for example, we asked uh, one of the question is like, uh, given the NYC collision data, mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me what is, uh, where is the most a uh, dangerous place in New York City. Mm -hmm. And there are many different data questions. Mm -hmm. So for example, like the top five uh, boroughs with the 
highest number of collisions, mm -hmm. the top 10 places with the uh, highest number of dead persons mm -hmm. or killed persons or injured persons. Yeah. There are so many different data questions. Yes. So imagine that we have a system that provides such a uh, natural language query, mm -hmm. uh, like how do you think we need, uh, we should like help with this kind of diverse data questions? Yeah. How should the system interact with the data analyst? Yeah. Like with the di diversity, yeah, yeah, diverse data questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, that, that's a great question. And it, it's, it's another one that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, one of the products that I didn't talk about here that we built uh, we call it Spot IQ. It's basically an automated insight engine. And the, the, the stated goal of that product is to ask the questions that the user didn't think to ask, but was important for them, right? Uh, so I, I, think, I think there are many ways to think about it because th this is fundamentally what you're talking about is automating the mind of an analyst. And, and it's a fairly sophisticated task which requires a lot of real world context to be able to come up with the right questions. So, so the kind, the class of questions I was talking about earlier were in some ways a lower level question where like it's, it's a very specific question that give me the top 10 customers or give me the top 10 locations by collision rate in NYC, like top 10 zip code or things like that, right? But if you have a higher level question that like what's causing most of the collision um, th that requires deeper thinking. And so one way to do this is to make a really simple and fast system that allows anyone to ask the questions. Like, so, so they, a person starts from high level question and breaks it down into low level questions, but then they have a lot easier system to get answers to each of those questions, right? What we've done in Spot IQ is we've taken a page from Google in a sense that um, a lot of smartness that you see in Google is not intelligent algorithms inside Google figuring out things, but Google learning from its users. So for example, when someone asks for pictures of dog and they don't like the pictures and then they go and ask pictures of puppies, Google makes a relationship between dogs and puppies. And if enough number of people do it, it knows that when someone is asking for pictures of dogs, it's helpful to include the pictures of puppies in there as well, right? Uh, so what we do is whenever someone is asking data questions, we make a note of which question they went from <laughs> this question to and which question they went from this question to and so on and so forth. So there's a Bayesian model that says that if the user is interested in this thing, what are the next hundred questions they might be interested in? And then what we've done is built a system that can efficiently go get the answers to those hundred questions, and then look through those answers to see if there's a in meaningful insight in there to present to the user, right? Uh, so th th that's one way of doing it, uh, that you start from a high level metric, like number of collisions in New York, and then you say, if somebody's interested in number of collisions in New York, what are the other hundred questions they might ask? Let's go ask those questions. Let's look at the answers. And if you see something meaningful in there, let's present it back to the user, right? Uh, the other way that I've thought about it, and we haven't done anything with it or built anything, is that I, I think asking these kinds of questions requires building some sort of a model in your head of how the real life processes are working, right? Um, so what causes an individual collision to happen? It, um, because like person X is going from one place to the other, person Y is going from one place to the other, they kind of overlap and there's some mistake made by someone or um, something happened. How often do these things happen? What causes accident rate to go up or down? What causes more traffic to happen and things like that. And, and then based on that, build a mental model of what should be the amount of collision in a given time, in a given place, and what are the drivers, and then you test each of these relationships and figure out where there is an interesting divergence from what you expected. Hopefully that answers your question. I, I know I hand-waved over a lot of different things. There's one question online, and then I have one in case nobody else okay. asks. Uh, so the online question is, to a large extent, research in natural language for data visualization is constrained to English 
as the language of instruction, querying, and mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. What are your opinions on extending it to multilingual case cases, and how does it manifest in an industry setting? Yeah, so we get this question a lot from Japan. <laughs> uh, and, and this is where I think um, a lot of times there's a lot of beauty in simplicity. So, so the, the earlier system that I was describing, which was purely sort of um, segmenting a sentence and then finding matches and then composing them together and then doing a beam search for what is the most likely question, that is fairly language independent. Uh, but as, as you go into large language models and generating features from those or parts of speech tagging and things like that, then, then you do have to specialize for different languages. And I, I think we are at a certain, such a nascent stage that, and since most of the people I know working on this space are more comfortable in English, most of the customers are more comfortable in English, I think majority of this work is happening in English. But once we crack a few of these nuts, I think it wouldn't be very hard to generalize them across other languages. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. So I have a question regarding the semantics. So I'm wondering, like, because in industrial setting, the, 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 the data is noisy. Yeah. And when analyzing such semantics of the Tableau data, I was wondering how we can like it, it, it involves the data cleaning and also the wrangling. Mm -hmm. So how do you derive the semantics of uh, noisy data and also how we gonna integrate like common sense knowledge because we have a common sense and we may ask questions. And, uh, and for example, the New York is from America, right? And city and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of also other like physical common sense and also new, numerical common sense. So how do you call, uh, deal with that? Maybe the second question is more technical about NLP and the first is yeah. about data cleaning. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think uh, about data cleanliness, I think uh, I would say that the scope of problem is already large enough that we don't need to complicate it further by assuming that data is dirty, right? If we solve the problem for clean data, I would be elated. And then we can worry about how do we do it for dirty data. And there, there are a lot of people, companies in the industry who see enough value in the problem that they would anyway spend a lot of money and time to clean the data for their use cases. So if, if you solve sort of the top layer of the problem, it already unlocks a lot of value. And we could almost independently worry about cleaning data. And I'm sure there's um, interesting things that we can do on the NLP perspective to uh, make the data cleaner. But I haven't spent a lot of time working on that. Now, the second question in terms of common sense, I, I would sort of segment common sense into two parts. One is sort of the real common sense in the sense that almost most literate human beings would understand that. And then there's sort of enterprise specific common sense where like a group of people within the enterprise understands it, understand it, but the machines don't, right? So, so sort of the public domain common sense, I think slowly large language models are getting there to having more and more of that sense. Uh, but the, the, the private part I think remains a challenge. And this is where I think some of the transfer learning, meta learning kind of things uh, would be really interesting. Or, or the thing that I was talking about where um, a machine is able to index knowledge that's a, uh, a neural net is able to index knowledge that's external to the neural net. That could be an interesting approach. Yes, I, I just have one last comment is about the, when I do the experiment on large language models, I found that its numerical sense is really, is, they don't have much sense about yeah. numericals. So they don't know how to multiplication. They don't know how large is 1,000 compared to 10. Yes. So this kind of scale, they have no sense. And uh, I think solving this kind of uh, tableau data analysis needs this kind of numerical reasoning to some extent. So I was exciting to explore this kind of so thing. So I, I don't think of this as large language models giving you the final answer. Like, I, I don't want to ask a large language model what is 1001 times 2002. What I want them to do is help me translate the intent of the question into SQL or something like that. 
So it's, I see that more as a machine translation problem. I see. Thank you very much. All right. In the interest of time, we need to move on. But let's thank Amit for his keynote. And <laughs> thank you so much. It's a pleasure. So we're going to slightly tweak the program because we wanted to make sure people had an opportunity to ask questions. So we're going to start off with the first paper, uh, Why More Text is Often Better, Themes from Reader Preferences for Integration of Charts and Text by Chase Stokes and Marty Hurst, and Chase is going to be presenting. And we will move the second paper in this first session after the coffee break uh, because we uh, we actually have one presentation that's going to be canceled. So that gives us some time for um, Chase to present and answer any questions. No preference. Okay. Well, thank you, Amit, for a fantastic presentation and for getting us started today. Um, I'm really looking forward to being here with all of you and talking about um, language and visualization and sort of all things in between. So my name is Chase Stokes. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley, advised by Marty Hurst. And here uh, today, I'm here to talk to you about why more text is often better based on reader preferences for sort of this integration of charts and text. So the data for this paper in particular comes from the data for a larger paper, which is at the Friday session, uh, the natural language session. So if anything I say is interesting at all, do check that session out. Um, it's got a lot more information about this particular project as well. So it's pretty rare that you'll come across a chart like this with no text whatsoever. Usually you need axes labels to understand what is being presented, a title to kind of situate you to what is going on or what the intent is, and maybe an annotation to give you some more context about particular data points or particular moments in time. And one of the motivating questions for this project was, when does it become too much? At what point is there too much text on the chart that it becomes too cluttered to understand or overwhelming for the reader? And as a spoiler alert for Friday, we actually found that participants like having more text. They prefer the charts with more text over charts with less text. So this gave us a really interesting sort of insight into reader preferences and motivated the question, what attributes of charts with text do readers find appealing or unappealing in comparison to a chart or text on its own? In the full study, participants completed a survey with four main sections. For the purposes of today, we're most interested in this view stimuli section. So participants viewed seven variants of the same information split into two sets. This first set ranged from a chart only to a text only variant, um, encompassing sort of the extremes of these uh, two modes of communication. And the second set um, contained smaller variations, just adding a single annotation per chart. In the paper uh, accompanied with this, we use these names for the variants in particular for this talk. I don't need you to remember these. I'll use the um, icons as well as the names, but this is just here for your um, sort of benefit. So in this section, uh, participants viewed each variant individually and responded to the question, what do you like or dislike about this method of presenting information? And they could say as much or as little as they wanted in this, in this area. They then went on to rank these charts in their respective sets um, for how much they preferred to sort of engage with them or see them. And the finding, again, I'll repeat it, people liked this more text. They liked heavier texted charts with more information and they disliked these charts without text. And so that's a really key point um, that we'll mention as we move through. We had 302 participants on Prolific complete this, uh, or on MTurk, excuse me, complete this study. They each viewed seven stimuli. So this gave us a really rich set of over 2,000 responses de depicting uh, preferences for these different variants that we then delved into and came up with these three themes that are present. I'll talk through each one uh, individually. To start, we're gonna look at clutter or context. Um, so this theme in particular pertains to the chart variants, not the text only variants. So these are all the, the chart variants that they saw. Um, and we'll go through each one individually, talk about what responses people said and, and that sort of thing. So for the variants with less text, here are a couple example responses. Again, this is a set of 2000. So these are just a few selected from that set. But we can see pretty much immediately that participants enjoy the simplicity of these kinds of visualizations. They're straightforward, they're quick to understand, and overall they're very simple. This was also a drawback. They lacked a lot of important context. They didn't like that there weren't any annotations. And in, in particular for this, uh, 
This one without a title, participants commented explicitly on the lack of a title. It felt very odd for them not to see this key component of text on the chart. So when we added an annotation, it makes sense that participants liked the extra facts. They liked the added explanations. They were still able to easily and quickly understand it, but they now had more information uh, to do so with. However, it wasn't quite enough. People still had other questions about the data they wanted answered. They also found that some of the descriptions we added weren't what they would have wanted. So the particular way that we added text to this was a lot of descriptive language describing what was happening in the visualization. Sometimes participants found this to be repetitive with the visualization itself, and they, they didn't prefer that um, in this case with the maximum annotation. So when we add another annotation, we find similar things and it's just sort of increasing. We have more people saying that they liked this extra information and we also have more people saying that there's too much text or that it's cluttering, it's redundant. Um, there's sort of these drawbacks that we're encountering. And these continue as we move to the one with the most amount of text where it's a lot to take in. There's a lot of text. We even included um, visual annotation components so like gray arrows or blue dots to indicate, uh, to go along with the text annotations and it provided a lot of visual clutter. However, you still have people saying this is easy to read, it's concise, and they really appreciated this uh, multimodal form of communication where they received both a written explanation and a visual explanation for what was going on. And when we remember that in the scope of all of these charts, people rated this one the highest, the one with the most amount of text, the most cluttered one, we can start to understand this trade-off between context and clutter, in which readers and the participants in this study in particular weighted context higher than they weighted clutter. They wanted to see this context, and they wanted to see it even when it was creating this more cluttered view of the data. So I'm gonna move on to the second theme. Um, I don't want you to think that I've forgotten about this text-only variant that we looked at. This is the primary focus of this theme, um, as it afforded some interesting things to the, uh, the conclusions and to the preferences. So participants really appreciated that it, it showed this story over time. The way it was written, um, so this was all representing temporal data, and so it was written in a logical temporal flow, and they liked this. It was easy to understand, um, and in particular, they noted that this, this use of language allowed for maybe a little bit more nuance or detail provided than the visualization. However, along with that, they wanted the visual representation as well or instead of, usually alongside, um, and this was also it took much longer for them to work through. It was longer to read. Visualization is really powerful because it's very quick, right? So this all text version was a little bit slower, a little bit harder to understand. Um, and so from these responses, we sort of came up with this theme that said, text alone is taxing. It's slow. It's maybe a little bit more complicated, um, but it provides a clear narrative. And it's got these unique affordances um, that visualization alone didn't receive any comments on. We didn't get a lot of comments on narrative in the visualization uh, variants that we did get in this text only variant. And so finally, I'm gonna move to the third theme, which is misleading and manipulating. And so we're gonna return back to these chart variants. Interestingly enough, the text variant did not get a lot of comments on this, which I'm happy to talk about more as well, but um, the chart variants are of interest here. As we look at, again, our less texted charts, we find that people liked not only that it was simple, like we talked about earlier, but also that it was sort of clean. It presented the data in a way that let it speak for itself. The reader was able to make their own determination about what was happening. And even as we move from this chart-only condition to the chart title, we find that we start getting comments about injecting an opinion. So there was something else going on with the addition of text into these visualizations um, that was really key to understanding participants' preferences. And as we move to these versions with more annotations, um, this becomes a bigger issue, right? People find it hard to believe that this is what we should be getting, getting from this visualization. They felt um, like it was talking to them too much, um, that they may have been you know, led by the visualization and in some cases misled by the visualization, in particular the text accompanying it. Um, and so overall we find that charts with annotations were more likely to be seen as having potential for author bias or author slant or for misleading the reader. Um, and although this was a less common theme in the raw numbers of the people who mentioned it, um, which we talk about in the paper as well, it points to a really particularly interesting and important thing we need to think about when adding text to visualization. So we know from the first theme that people want the text, they want the context, they want the information. And now we know that also in adding that, sometimes you're adding a bit too much of yourself um, in the text and you're adding a bit too much slant um, and people are able to pick up on that and comment on that more so than when it's a uh, uh, just the data or an all text variant. 
And so I want to come back to this, this sort of rich set of responses that we collected and, and indicate that of these 2,000 responses, we're talking about three themes. There's a lot more in this data set that we are not necessarily touching on uh, in this talk, uh, but certainly in the paper as well. Uh, and so I really encourage everyone to think really, really critically about uh, the role of reader preferences in the way that we are pairing text with visualization. And I'm happy to share this data. I believe it's open access, but if not, it will be soon. And um, I'm happy to share the data set and talk with you all about uh, the sort of insights we're finding and, and, and share this as a, as a community. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. And hello, and Hi. very interesting study. And so for me, I'm just wondering if the complexity of the chart itself affects how much text people would prefer. For example, for a simple chart, maybe people are willing to have more text. But if you have a very complex realization already, maybe they will be less willing to have more text on it. Is that something you look at in this study? Not in this study. I want to thank you for your question, though, because I think that's a really important future area of investigation. So in this particular study, we looked at only univariate line charts, like the ones here. Um, so we weren't looking at more complex visualizations or more novel visualizations either. I think that the role of text in those cases um, is really important and interesting to look at as well. I think you make bring a, up a great point of potentially they'd want less text because the, the view of the data is already so complex. And what I would also pose is maybe they want more to tell them more about how to interpret it or what's going on or to give them some kind of like grounding uh, knowledge about the data. So I think that's a really important future step for this kind of work uh, in understanding because there's really there's reasoning for both both areas. And so um, that's something that I would ask the, the participants for sure. Um, hi, um, thank you for your presentation. So I had like two questions. The sure. first was. Um, you mentioned like the narrative aspects that they were focusing on text versus like the when they were looking at the charts. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know whether you had any data about like the order in which they were starting to look at like the text annotations on the chart. Are they looking at the value labels in the title first? Or are they looking at the trend related annotations of visual marks? That's the first question. And then I'll ask the second one later. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, we did not look at necessarily what order they looked at um, the text in. We know, I think, from prior work that titles are really salient and they draw the eye pretty early on and, and uh, pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not certain exactly the sort of ways in which a viewer will, might, might parse the, the visualization and move through the annotations. Um, that would be a, a really interesting further question that I'd love to get into. My background in psychology, so that kind of eye-tracking question is really something that I find very, quite fascinating. Yeah. And um, my second question was, um, it sort of related to the previous question as well. So um, one problem with like putting a lot of annotation on a chart is that if you make the chart like too cluttered, what happens is when you ask someone later on like what they're recalling from the chart, they're just able to tell you what the chart looks like. They don't remember yeah. what the trend is or what the data is, or they can't do the math as a data representation. They think of it like an image and mm -hmm. describe it as an image. So were you able to find any like data that was sort of a tipping point in how they're like talking about the chart later on? Yeah, I'm not certain. So in the, um, thank you for your question as well. In the um, full paper, we look at takeaways as well, but we're not quite looking at um, some of these more heavily annotated versions for yeah. the takeaway. We only look at ones with one or two pieces of text. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question. I think it also speaks to a lot of the ways in which we can conceptualize understanding of visualization. So you have recall is one, you have takeaways is another, and preferences is sort of another component of that. And these all get at a different question about understanding and engaging with a visualization. I think recall is an important, an, another area, um, in particular when we're thinking about what they're actually taking away. If we throw you know eight annotations at them, yeah. which one's most important, or are any of them gonna, gonna make it through? Okay. So thank you. Thank you. We're going to hold off on questions here, but Chase is not going to go away. So um, you can try to meet him at the coffee break. We want to make sure we have time for a coffee break and then come back. And we're going to start with uh, the paper that was pushed out to the second session. And so come back and have some coffee. Thank you all.